and uh, welcome everybody and thanks for attending this event. We will talk today about the uh, open science uh, with the main speaker, uh, Dr. John Tennant, and uh, I will start introducing uh, Kira Stine Hansen, who is the, the vice director of the Copenhagen uh, University Library, because uh, this event has been arranged uh, jointly by the library and the Copenhagen University. Mm -hmm. So just a short word of why, around why we are here. It's uh, to create awareness of the big why, why do we want to work with open science in Copenhagen University, and also creating a debate about how will we do it. Uh, so therefore, it is a very good situation to start out as the first initiative to actually have John talking because he's sometimes, and I hope that's okay to say, provocative around why should we go into the open science agenda. And I think that's a very good starting point for us to actually be a little bit aware and awake around why are we actually discussing this topic. At the 18th of September, we had a, a, a workshop for the LT, co LT, where Henrik was at the, the table. Uh, and we had a discussion around especially the why and how are we going to do it in Copenhagen University. We used the label, uh, the eight pillars of a roadmap, how to implement open science as a discussion. Uh, uh, ground uh, and we were talking about which initiative would already suit into the Copenhagen University strategy but also which initiatives should we might start up uh, and we will follow up on that discussion by um, maybe in February having a workshop on the eight pillars of, uh, of interest uh, for everybody who actually wants to attend we will come back to that but that's uh, hopefully a way into the university to having this awareness and also the debate about uh, the strategic issues that we are already doing and which ones should we take. And because this is a culture change more than a technical issue, this is a culture change within the research uh, environment. So therefore, it's not only people like the university librarian and uh, Kim uh, for EFI and uh, KUFIA, uh, 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 the agendas at KUFIA, it is also something that we should embed within the local environment. So therefore, it's really crucial that we have the debate all over the community university. So this is the first initiative. And I'm the one who's going to introduce John. No. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. John Tennant uh, has a very interesting profile. Uh, when reading it, uh, he has uh, his PhD in his um, authorities. Dinosaurs. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he has been uh, studying evolution uh, and uh, the biology of crocodiles and dinosaurs. Uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, he is a research fellow uh, in Paris in the Center of uh, Research and uh, Multidisciplinarity. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. And uh, at, the, uh, at the same time, uh, he's also a research uh, visiting fellow at the Sudanske Universitet here in, uh, in Denmark, in Odense. And uh, it's a big pleasure to have him here today, especially he has just arrived from Qatar and he's uh, traveling tomorrow to Sweden, I think. So he has a very uh, busy agenda. And he will hopefully entertain us for about uh, an hour. And then we will have a discussion of uh, 30 minutes Plus, uh, some drinks at the end. Let's rock. All right. So, thank you for that kind introduction. Sorry, and um, thank you, Michael, for the invitation to be here, and thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, to be here. So, yeah, the the framing for this talk is going to be mostly around the culture change that revolves around whatever is called open science or open research or open scholarship. I'll use the three of them mostly interchangeably throughout this talk. And um, it'll focus around three main themes within this. So the first will be sort of the ongoing changes around what is called Plan S and these transformative agreements mostly focused in Europe. The second will be about learning from what's been happening in Latin America and other places around the world about initiatives uh, outside of Europe. And then the third is I'll briefly discuss the 
always elephant in the room of research evaluation reform, um, because that is one of the most sort of critical elements of the sort of cultural change. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I have all of the answers or even understand what open science is throughout this. There will be a few provocative things, as mentioned, to sort of inspire discussion, hopefully. Um, but then if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them and for some feedback. So I made a promise to people that I would always start presentations <coughs> with this slide here. So has anyone ever read the United Declarations, uh, United Nations, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights? Has anyone read it? But it's a fairly important document in defining our society, right? <laughs> you know, the human rights are these fundamental things to, that belong to each of us. If you read Article 27 of the Declaration, it says that everyone has the right to freely participate in the culture of the arts and scientific advancement. So that's the sort of framing where I come from in the space that I believe that the UN Declaration on Human Rights says that we all deserve to have access to scientific research and knowledge. Okay? <clears throat> now, within this, like I mentioned, we're in the sort of a global research evolution or revolution, depending on how you want to how you want to discuss this. So there are at least sort of five major problems that fit within the sort of banner of open science in general. The first of these is the access problem. So we've probably all heard of open access. Um, the fact is that most research that we have ever produced on this planet remains inaccessible to most people on this planet since the origins of scholarly research. Uh, in about 25 years of relentless campaigning by the open access movement and the investment of billions and billions and billions of euros of public money, we have managed to make about 25 to 28% of all research that we have ever created open access, which isn't great. The second is the reproducibility crisis. If your work in fields like psychology or social sciences um, in these fields, most sort of uh, quantitative research cannot be reproduced. It cannot be effectively uh, yeah, or replicated. And this is not necessarily because the research itself is wrong. It's because the way in which we're communicating it through journals and PDFs does not necessarily lend itself to reproducibility because it's not representative of the actual process of research itself. Uh, for librarians in the room, the serials crisis. This was something uh, defined in about uh, 1990. And this is the fact that um, in the last 30 years, the cost of subscribing to research journals has gone up at about 300% the rate of inflation. The, uh, by analogy, like if you wanted to think about that, if, uh, if the price of gas or petrol had gone up at the same rate, it would be about 33 euros per gallon if it had gone up at the same rate, which is outrageous. And the, this means that no individual no uh, group, no institute, and no country can afford to subscribe to the research that it needs to do in order to fulfill its mission. The fourth is the evaluation crisis. This is the fact that we're still judged based more on where we publish rather than what we publish as researchers, which is incredible. I remember that my mum told me when I was about four years old, don't judge a book by its cover. And yet the supposedly most intellectual people in the world judge all of us based on the, books, uh, the cover of the books in which we publish, which is incredible. Um, and the last one is copyright. So this is, you know, uh, yeah, not, not that interesting really, <laughs> unless you're a copyright lawyer. Uh, the fact is copyright law was designed as something, as a legal framework to protect creators and authors. And yet now it is used by the commercial industry to suppress innovation and the sharing of knowledge. And if you think about these five things in the context of what I said before about the Declaration of Human Rights, it means that things perhaps are not working as well as they should be. So open science comes into this as sort of a counterculture, if you want to think about it like this. And I stole this beautiful image from Brian Nosek, the founder of the Center for Open Science. And he likes to talk about open science at sort of five different levels. So that's why we have policy changes. And this includes things like Plan S or the Research Excellence Framework in the, U in the UK. Things that work from uh, top down to make uh, open scientific practices uh, required. And then you have different things like providing infrastructure and tools so that people are actually able to do open research practices. And then you have things like making it normative. So this is things like building communities of practice around uh, that can actually be the cultural uh, change in itself. Now, this is kind of important. So if you have watched the news recently, there are many problems that our world is facing at the moment. You know, um, my research was on mass extinctions, for example, and I can tell you that Having a mass extinction is not necessarily good for life on this planet. And yet we're on the brink of the sixth mass extinction right now. 
In fact, it's probably already too late. We're undergoing irreversible, catastrophic, global climate disruption. You know, the Amazon is on fire, Borneo is on fire. These are things that are affecting all of us. And this is where the UN Sustainable Development Goals come in. These are the things that we need to invest in if we want to actually have a sustainable planet that we can live on in the future. And yet, having most research locked away and treated as a commodity by private entities, not reproducible, not transparent, not rigorous, and not open, means that science is not working as well as it needs to be in order to address the problems that we face. For example, around 70% of research on climate change remains behind paywalls. That's unacceptable. Um, so yeah, we have to sort of acknowledge that the way in which the system works right now is designed in order to actually create problems. Um, and it's not necessarily anyone's fault in this room, but it's more uh, a systemic issue based around the, uh, the way in which we've designed the scholarly communication uh, process through the present uh, scholarly publishing industry. And this is not just something which is um, you know, uh, a little blip in the system. This is actually how the system is designed. The system is set up to prevent access to knowledge, to, to suppress sort of innovation and all, all of this sort of thing. So open science comes into this in a number of ways. Like there are many different, if you speak to, if you ask anyone in here from this space, they'll give you a different definition of open science. But if you just follow the EU's definition for now, um, they sort of frame around these eight very sort of pragmatic or uh, process-based elements. So for, this includes things hopefully we're familiar with, like open data. This is simply sharing the data that you produce as a researcher to, so that other people can, can build upon it or reuse it. Having open source software so that people can actually use the code to, or, or, whatever, or scripts to analyze the data and see if you can reproduce the results. And then open access. This is one which the most focus has happened on in the last 25 or 30 years because research papers are sort of like where the most value lies in terms of um, the finances and sort of evaluation. But if we actually want to think about, <laughs> about what open science is, um, if you want to read the only systematic review that tries to define what open science is, ironically, it is paywall by Elsevier, um, so you can't, <laughs> but I pulled out the definition for you here. And they simply describe open science as transparent and accessible knowledge shared and developed through collaborative networks. Very simple. Um, yeah, for me that just sounds like science. And Mick Watson, a genome biologist from the University of Edinburgh, says the same thing. He, he wrote an uh, editorial in genome biology a few years ago, four years ago now. And he said, you know, open science is just carrying out scientific research in a transparent manner and making the results of that research available to everyone else. And isn't that just science? So I, I don't understand what open science is. I don't understand the difference between open science and good science, really, or just rigorous science, well, in this case. Now. I tested this slide on someone the other day um, just to see if I could have a few sort of provocative st statistics that I believe that we should all know. Uh, when I tested it on someone, she said that it made her feel sick after understanding these things. These are all, you know, sort of um, the things that get me out of bed in the morning, if you, if you will. So, Holzbrink is the German conglomerate that owns Spring and Nature, one of the largest publishers in this space. The two people, the Van Holtzbergs, who own Spring and Asia, are together worth four and a half billion euros for two people. That is more than the entire UK invests in research annually. Two people own that much. Elsevier, everyone's favorite publisher, generated about one billion euros in net profit last year. One billion euros. How much does Denmark invest in basic research each year? <laughs> yes. these, these are big numbers. The total amount of revenue generated by the English language STM journal market is estimated to be about 10 billion euros a year. But it could be up to 25 billion, we actually don't know, because the entire system is incredibly opaque. And this is 10 billion, remember, to provide limit, uh, restricted access to very few people on this planet, unless you are financially privileged. Profit margins of, of about 30% are standard in this, uh, in, in this industry. Elsevier generate about 37 to 38% net profit each year, so that's after taxes. Um, if you want some context for that, uh, Apple generates about 21%. So this is the most profitable industry in the world. And about 70% of the revenue for this industry comes from public funding, public institutes. 
So they are generating ridiculous amounts of profit to sustain a dysfunctional system at the expense of the public purse. Um, the average amount we spend on accessing each article amounts to about 3,800 to 5,000 euros a year if you take the total amount we publish and divide it by the total amount of revenue, sort of back of the envelope, about 5,000 euros per article just to access, this is to pay for research again, which we, which uh, research funders fund, which research institutes support, which researchers create, and then give away to publishers to sell back to us. So we provide the least value in, in all of this. The true cost of publishing, based on efficient systems, which we, uh, based on modern technologies that we know readily exist, is about $400 per article. So about 90% of this revenue is going on inefficiency. Um, but we know that the actual cost of production for, for an article can be as low as about $2. For example, the Journal of Open Source Software is run by essentially software engineers who understand how technology works, and their operating costs are about $1.34 per article. So, yes, these are some numbers which I feel like we should all know, <laughs> just for framing. <clears throat> and this has led to what I would, you know, depending on how you look at it, the slow growth of open access. So, the term open access itself was only coined in about 2001. And what we can see here, this is um, some research by Heather Pior and colleagues in, uh, from Vancouver. And this is essentially just the rate of growth of the different forms of open access through time. Everything in grey represents things that remain inaccessible. And what they found, the rate is slightly increasing, so about 40% of all articles produced last year were made open access, but still the total amount estimated is only about 28% of all research is open access. And again, this is despite decades of lobbying and billions of, uh, of euros of funding. So depending on how you look at it, this is either a resounding success or a catastrophic failure, and I'll leave that to you to decide. But what's, what might some of the causes for this, this growth be? So, the commercial industry, again, Elsa Wirschberger, all the big bad boys, they lobby very aggressively in the EU and North America in particular against any sort of growth of open access, any sort of progressive open access policies. For example, Elsa alone have six lobbyists who sit in Brussels and make sure that the things that we all want to achieve in science never happen. <laughs> the, uh, the prices are just too high. It does not cost 5,000 euros to create a PDF. <laughs> it just doesn't. Uh, researcher attitudes towards open access. Most researchers want to just do research, and they, are, they have a, a lot of curiosity and want to share that curiosity and their discoveries with the world. They are generally apathetic towards open access because they just want to get the work out there, get that experience, so they can continue doing the work. But they also have a terrible understanding of open access. Think about what the average researcher knows about open access. It's virtually nothing. 50% of them know less than that, statistically. <laughs> right? there, there is a distinct lack of knowledge um, about open access and open science in general. Reconciling with different stakeholder interests. Now, no politician wants to cripple a very highly successful industry because it's essentially career suicide. And they have this problem where they are trying to reconcile the differences between what librarians want, what students want, what the industry wants, what we all in this room might want. Um, and policymakers have the difficulty of doing this on a very short time frame until they want to get elected again. So they're not thinking about the long-term sustainability of scholarly communication in this sort of framework. Um, there's a complete lack of global synchrony cooperation in this space. That's just uh, a sort of you know, how the world works, I guess. You know, what's happening in Latin America, for example, is distinct from what's happening in China and Japan. All over the world, it's completely different. Everyone sort of wants to do their own thing. And there's been a lack of uh, sharing of knowledge, sharing of technology and infrastructure, sharing of, of skills, and just um, sharing of what works and what maybe doesn't work in some cases. Um, the research evaluation culture. I will touch a bit, uh, a bit on this in a bit. And the lack of a functioning market. This is a big problem. So, in a normal market, comp competition, fair competition drives prices down. Um, in the scholarly communication market, we have a runaway market that's completely unregulated, and the prices, like I mentioned, are, are completely sterilized. And the reasons for this are that uh, every single scientific article and journal is non-substitutable. If, if I'm a researcher and I want to read a particular article, I have to access that article. I can't just replace it with a different one. 
from a different journal. So this is the theory of non-substitutable goods, where every single journal and every single article acts as a mini-monopoly, where the people who own it can charge essentially what they want, so 5,000 euros, for example. Uh, the second are what are called non-disclosure agreements. These are questionably legal things that the scholarly publishing industry apply to their customers as well do. They basically say, you can't tell other people how much we are charging and for what services. And uh, ironically, a chap called David Tempest, who works for Elsevier, has been publicly caught saying that the reason why they apply these non-disclosure agreements is because if everybody knew what everybody else was paying and for what services, this would drive the prices down, and we don't want that. So they're using these to create market dysfunction. And for some reason, the European Commission is allowing that. So, most recently, this has led to Plan S. So, the solution to all of our problems. It's been hailed as like the global revolution in open access and social communication. It was uh, launched by Coalition S, which is a group of 11 research funders, um, <coughs> primarily in Europe, and is beginning to spread all around the world. The, the primary uh, function of Plan S essentially is to make all research that these funders uh, fund uh, is open access by, I think, 2025. It's, it's changing all the time. So it recognized that the growth was slow and is attempting to catalyze this um, through sort of uh, a top-down approach in this case. Or is it just a plaster for a much bigger wound? You know, is making everything open access going to solve all of our problems? Um, what the, what Lance has done is create um, a sort of new dynamic in this space. So previously, what the publishers used to do was negotiate with individual libraries, um, yeah, individual contracts, with individual libraries, a sort of divide and conquer approach. Now, people are uh, people. What's happening in Europe in particular? is that consortia are forming, um, and I believe one thing set up in Denmark, right? Yeah. Um, where they're now negotiation, ne negotiating national licenses with these publishers to both subscribe to their journals and also to have a certain proportion of them made open access. And this has led to a really bizarre and interesting sort of dynamic where now some of these consortia are completely cutting off um, uh, any sort of negotiation or relationship with these publishers, whereas others are signing deals on the order of tens to hundreds of millions of euros just to, with individual publishers to publish their work. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think Denmark has signed any of these deals yet, but a lot of other countries have. And there's a lot of money exchanging hands. And this is sort of uh, what Planners has set the precedence for, is these large scale, what we call open access or transformative deals to take place. And I'm not sure if these things are better or worse at the moment, and I'm going to leave this for you to decide. But I'll use this one as an example. Five people on the left are the Project Deal Consortium in Germany. They're the ones who've been negotiating on behalf of more than 200 institutes in Germany. The chap on the right is the uh, now ex-CEO of Spring and Asia. They just signed uh, one of these big transformative agreements in Germany. So three years, 13,000 articles will be published. The cost of that was around 100 million euros, or just under 3,000 euros per article. Remember what I said about the cost of publishing being as low as 400? The reason why he is so happy is because he just got a check for 100 million euros of ta primarily taxpayers' money to take all of their work and sell it back to them. It doesn't work like this in any other industry. In English, we have a saying, laughing all the way to the bank. He retired about two weeks after signing this deal. <laughs> it's funny, and it's also really not funny at the same time. Right? This is an outrageous misuse of public funding, I believe. So it's up to you to decide whether this is better or worse. But this is the sort of precedence and the big thing which are happening at the moment. And I believe that we're sort of running out of time in this space. Because if these deals continue to become normative, they're going to start just, we're going to see runaway costs again, we're going to see the same market dysfunction, we're going to see the same over-reliance on the research evaluation culture. And poor researchers are sort of locked into the space because they are primarily still evaluated based on where they publish. So we all know that this is probably really bad, but yet we do it anyway. And it's this, I call it a disastrous blend of Stockholm Syndrome and cognitive dissonance, where we love the publishers for all of the harm which they impose on us, and we keep uh, giving them all of our money and all of our work, despite knowing that it, it's actually probably not that good. Um, and I believe that there has been um, quite a lack of leadership in this space from people who have been signing these deals um, in terms of thinking about what they want for the future of scholarly communication 
on a sort of global level in the context of all the things I mentioned before about you know, the sustainable development goals and having science acting in the best interest of society. And things are actually getting worse. So you know, the primary uh, way of funding these, um, these open access deals is through article processing charges, where you know, this is the thing about three to 4,000 euros per article. And already what we're seeing is the bottom two lines here represent the uh, rate of inflation over the last 14 years. And the black line represents the average APC. And as you can see, it's skyrocketing up. And again, if we had a healthy, functioning, fair, competitive market, it would be going down, but it's not. And this is the sort of system that we're creating. So uh, it's leading to a, a system of hyperinflation, it's called, and potentially another second open access crisis where, again, libraries cannot afford to pay to make their work open access because the publishers are just ramping up the costs as much as they want. So that was part one-ish, I guess. <laughs> so the second is, like, what can we learn from what's been happening around the rest of the world? Um, you know, Obviously, things aren't working that great, but some things are. And like I mentioned, it's a very sort of heterogeneous landscape out there. And I'm going to um, focus on what's been happening in Latin America for the next little part of this, because I believe that they've been doing something very progressive in this space. So, SILO is the Scientific Electronic Library of Light. It was founded by a chap called Abel Packer in 1997 as an infrastructure to support open access journals in Brazil, primarily, and now it covers 13 different countries across uh, Latin America, uh, Spain, Portugal, and South Africa. Um, they were doing, essentially, open access as the norm before we even came up with the word open access. And now the people in charge of Plan S are going down to Brazil and Argentina and Chile saying, hey look, we've got Plan S, the solution to all of your problems, and they're saying, actually mate, we've been doing this far better than you since you even, you know, <laughs> this is before you even came up with the word open access. And they do it very successfully. Um, there are no author-facing costs. The average cost of production per article is, shockingly, about 400 euros, because they use efficient technology. Uh, for Sayola, they focus mostly on biomedicine and the STEM subjects. And there are, it, it works. It's a community-led, government-sponsored infrastructure supporting community-driven journals without the problems associated with the industry that we have here in Europe. Um, and they're great. <laughs> um, they're sort of partnering in crime in all of them. That's the wrong word to use. They're partnering in all of this, uh, or counterpart, is um, Redelic. So again, focused in Latin America, mostly on the humanities and social sciences. Again, providing support and infrastructure and technologies for efficient production of research in these countries. And they also generate bibliometric indicators. Things like the impact factor don't really exist down there. They just don't need them. Fantastic. And yeah, they produce about half a million full text articles so far. So this is what I mean. Like, what I'm trying to say is, in Latin America, open access has been the default since before we even came up with the term, and they've been doing it as a community-led, non-profit, government-funded initiative, and it works. And it works very well. And the two founders of these organisations are coming here actually to Europe uh, next week to essentially give us all the spanking and tell us how to do things properly, and it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> but why are they so effective? And um, I've been very lucky to spend a bit of time speaking with, with researchers and, and the founders of these organizations. And it, it's very different over there to what it's like here. So, you know, I, I was at Imperial College and all people really seemed to care about was producing papers to advance their career and doing research, I guess, as part of that. In Latin America, it seems to be a little bit different to me. They really seem to have a strong societal focus on why they're doing research. Like, it is unfathomable to them down there. To, you know, like, I don't want to generalize an entire uh, continent, but like in my experience, like it's unfathomable for them to produce all of this research that the governments are funding, and then to prevent access to it to the very people who need it. Like it just doesn't make any sense to them. And um, you know, there's a quote here from Victoria Pulitzer, and she says, "Iber American scientists are especially committed to the movement of open access and open science as a way to ensure that society actually benefits from their research." And I'm wondering if, like, you know, we're sort of lost this rationale, if you like, uh, around much of the rest of the world? Or is it just like the system is so dysfunctional in some cases that researchers just have, uh, they feel just so lost in the reason why they're doing research now? Um, and yeah, just due to sort of the systemic problems that I mentioned before. So in my view, Planus actually has it backwards. 
So what Dionysus has been trying to do is impose itself upon the rest of the world. Um, history reveals that Europe trying to essentially conquer the rest of the world doesn't always end particularly well, yet they're trying again. <laughs> um, and what we should be doing actually is that is, uh, I think in Europe is quieting our egos a little bit, stepping back and actually asking with humility, how can we learn from the successes of what's been happening in Latin America and adopt that here in Europe, potentially. And I think that is interesting. And if we can do that, then we can stop funneling literally billions of euros each year of taxpayers' money into the most profitable industry in the world that is creating most of the problems that we have. Epic. <laughs> so there's a great editorial about this um, by Humberto de Bat and Dominic Babini. Uh, just a couple of quotes just pulled from this. I, I really recommend reading this. It, it frames what I've just been discussing um, really nicely. And they say, like, why would Plan S try to impose itself on a system that works? Like, we know that what Plan S is setting precedents for is the continued treatment of research as a commodity to be traded away by private companies. Whereas in um, Latin America, the reality is um, that they have non-commercial open access initiatives that work with society and communities as the focus. And it's a really great editorial that I think describes this very well. And the next, the next quote is my absolute favorite. This is Ariana Bessero Garcia. She's the chair of, um, oh, she's the founder of Redlick and also the chair of what's called Amelica. Amelica is what they set up in Latin America as the counterpoint to Plan S. They said, all you're doing is just going to create all the same problem all over again. This is how we've been doing it successfully for 25 years. Please come and listen to us. And she, she has, if you want to watch a video of her describing these things, um, we publish one on YouTube. It's this, I'll, I'll make these slides available after. It's really worth watching. One of the best quotes is, he says, the commercial strategies that the for-profit publishers have adopted for open access are ravenous, exclusionary, and unsustainable. And this is entirely contrary to the vision of open access that America and thus Latin America supports. And I think it's beautiful. <laughs> so, um, so in the sort of wake of all of this, what, what happened um, earlier this year was um, the UN got involved, big time, uh, through UNESCO. And they got the founders of, like I said, uh, America and Sayelo and some other infrastructure platforms like African Journals Online, uh, Erudit, which is um, an organization from the French-speaking world, and JSAGE. These are essentially these non-profit, non-commercial infrastructures that support community-led open access. And they all got together, and they launched this, the Global Alliance of Open Access Scholarly Communication. And the framing for this is all around the sustainable development goals. Again, it's like, we need access to research to help solve the problems that society faces. And they're now doing this on a sort of quasi-global level. And what they're doing is they're trying to take control back from the for-profit industry uh, and return that power to the academics by investing in the development of shared and global, shared and open global scholarly infrastructure. So things could work <laughs> better in the future. Now, part three. <coughs> so the big barrier. The research evaluation culture is probably the most critical element of all of this. Every single discussion I've had about the future of scholarly communication in the last decade or so has always ended with, but you know, what about my career? What about the way I'm evaluated? What about promotion, tenure, uh, guidelines, and all this sort of thing? And you know, I think we have to be very empathetic towards this as being a major problem. Um, this is one of the things which is probably stifling most of the growth towards open access and open science too, because people are terrified that if they move away from the journal-based communication system and the evaluation system that's coupled to that, then it will put themselves at risk. And this is a very real threat which people face. Um, and it's because of this thing here, the impact factor, the journal impact factor. Has, has anyone not heard of the impact factor? Goody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but who knows how, it, how it's calculated and what it was designed for? If uh, does someone yell, yell? Oh, can you tell us? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was uh, so. It's the average number of publications per journal uh, sorry, the average number of citations per publication in a journal, and it was calculated uh, 40, 50 years ago to help a librarian select the journals for the library. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Just in case you didn't know, it was a bibliometric indicator developed in the 1970s by someone called Eugene Garfield as a tool for people, for librarians essentially, to decide which journals their researchers were using most so that they could allocate their budgets more effectively. Simple. Yet for some reason, it now is used to assess the quality of individuals 
and and of research articles, despite there being absolutely no reason for that sort of thing to happen. Nobody really knows why it happened <laughs> or where it came from, but it is the sort of reality that we face. And now this leads to this problem, this mantra called publish or perish. So I think we have one PhD student in the room, and it's probably over very fast. But this is the idea that if you are not constantly producing uh, journal articles and publishing them in high impact journals, then you are not going to advance your career. And that's true. And it's called publish or perish. And it's getting worse and worse and worse because more and more PhD students are coming into the system and are being told that unless they essentially become a professor within the next five years, they're a complete failure. And that they have to publish as much as they possibly can. In the UK, it is now becoming normal for if you apply for a PhD, you don't stand a chance unless you've already published one or two research papers. It's incredible. And this is in the scope of declining or decreasing uh, research budgets and um, academic senior, more senior academic positions as well. So we're forcing more people in while decreasing the gap and making the evaluation culture much worse. Um, yeah. So this is this publish or perish mentality, which is <coughs> governing a lot of, uh, or, or constraining a lot of growth. Um, and people have looked into just how bad this is. So this is some research led by uh, Han Padman Alper and Aaron McKinnon. Um, and they analyzed, uh, what they did was they gathered the review, promotion, and tenure guidelines at research institutes across uh, the United States and Canada. And what they found was that 87% of these institutes mentioned the impact factor and support its use in research evaluation for promotion, tenure, uh, pro <laughs> review, promotion, and tenure guidelines. Uh, guidelines. And at least 63% of research institutes associate the journal impact factor with quality, whatever that means. And this is despite there being zero association between those numbers. I think you also do something similar in Denmark as well, and we can talk about that. <laughs> in Europe, it's just as bad. The uh, European University Association released a report last week essentially looking at the same thing. They asked uh, institutes again around Europe, you know, how do you evaluate your researchers? And, uh, it's a really great report to read, it's damning. But again, they say the same thing. 75% of research institutes in Europe still use the impact factor to evaluate researchers and their outputs. And remember, I have to remind you, there is absolutely no reason for this to actually exist, despite laziness and the fact that it's easy to do. Uh, we wrote an editorial recently. Um, it got rejected from nature. <laughs> <laughs> and we said basically there's no, there's no theoretical, ethical or empirical basis for this widespread system to exist. And it should not be up to the three of us who wrote this, our uh, early career research, the postdoc, who were just, it should not be up to us to be calling, uh, the, calling out these problems. It should be the people who are in senior positions saying actually, yeah, this is not right. There is no rationale for this. We can do better. And in fact, we should be treating research evaluation with the same rigor and evidence base in which we expect people to do their research. Simple. Um, so, that was all very negative. <laughs> I take a lesson from one of my uh, mentors, Donald Draper, from the show <laughs> Mad Men, and he said, if you don't like what is being said, then it's time to change the conversation. So the question for most of the rest of this is gonna be, can we break this systemic inertia through better training, support, and communication? Um, and I'll, I'll highlight a couple of problems, just to emphasize why this is important. There is a distinct um, divergence between the attitudes and behaviors and practices of researchers. I think that every single person probably believes that access to science is a good thing for most people. And yet most of them don't put this into practice, for example. So um, the example here was published a couple of uh, uh, years ago. And what it did was it looked at the proportion of open access articles for global health research. I think this is research that helps to save people's lives and is generally a good thing. What they found was that 60% of researchers don't make their work open access by the green self-archiving route, even if it's completely free for them to do and there are no barriers or risks whatsoever. I do not understand why this is a problem. Like, I just don't get it. It takes five minutes to upload an article and yet 60% of researchers don't do this based around research that is designed to help save people's lives. So there's a divergence in attitudes and practice. Another thing we get too often as well is that open access is too expensive. And I really need to get rid of this because I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's half true. Open access is expensive in the way in which the system has currently been designed around it. 
you know, what we know is that it does not cost again five or six thousand euros to generate a PDF, but yet these are the prices being charged by the big corporate publishers. But if we look wider again, we can we can see that there are a number of uh, much more uh, financially sustainable routes to do this. I thought this uh, slide from Erin McKinnon. So if you look, for example, at the Directory of Open Access Journals, this is an indexing system which contains about 12,000 mostly community-led journals. About 70% of these journals charge zero because they're supported by other means, by small funds, grants, by governments, and all of this sort of thing. 70% of open access journals do not charge open access fees. Simple. And what we know as well is that self archiving costs nothing. So this is why being friendly with your librarians is great, because they you know, operate the institutional repositories that allow researchers to upload their accepted manuscripts for free. The, the, um, the, the publishers, again, they really don't like this, because if you can upload the peer-reviewed version of your work for free, then why would anyone subscribe to their journals? And yet they do. So the way the publishers get around this is they say, you can't share your work for 12 months or even longer, because we need to sell our copy of it with all the pretty formatting. What they're actually doing is, is uh, saying, we don't add enough value to the process to justify the cost that we're charging, and therefore you cannot have fair, uh, you cannot show your work early. It acts against the best interests of essentially everyone else, and demonstrates again just how bad the publishers are in this space. Um, but now, like the sort of open science movement has exploded, and there are now, this is a great little thing called the, uh, the Rainbow of Open Scientific Practices or something, by uh, two librarians from the University of Utrecht. And what they've done is um, systematically document all of the services, or organizations, and tools that exist at different layers of a typical research workflow, all the way from uh, writing grants through to research assessment and evaluation. And it's really, really useful. And this is about providing um, small stepwise bites that researchers or individuals or groups can take to adopting more open research practices and shifting the culture slightly. And this is important because, again, if you think about it historically, um, what a journal article is, is essentially an advert for research. You are, as a researcher, forced to construct a narrative around carefully selected results from your work and weave that into a nice story so that you can sell it to a journal and then they can give you the stamp of approval and the impact factor that you need to advance your career. That's sort of historically how it's worked. And what that is is like an advert for the research. It's not reflective of the research process itself. And this has led to all sorts of problems, such as, for example, in the field of psychology, about 95% of all published research results confirm the tested hypothesis, which is like the exact opposite way around it should be, because people are selectively um, choosing which, um, which bits of their research to put into the articles themselves and leaving the rest hidden away. Uh, um, just to never see the light of day, which is outrageous when you consider that, how much sort of wastage that leads to in terms of um, doing, result, uh, doing research that we know doesn't work but just has never been shared, duplication of effort, and all this sort of thing. So, open science again comes into this in terms of trying to make. Um, trying to make research more transparent and open so that it can become more reproducible. And if you think about it, the students who are sort of coming into university right now have never known a world without the internet. You know, if that makes you feel old. You know, yeah. And they don't understand the, the whole concept of journals and articles. It's just like, you know, we have this thing called the internet. Why aren't we using it to communicate research more effectively? Crazy. And now it's eminently easy to do things like share the data and the code and the coding environment and all the libraries and dependencies that go with it and push uh, sort of research more along the reproducibility spectrum towards something that actually more accurately reflects the, re uh, the, the research process itself. Um, so as the saying goes, science without open really is just an anecdote or an advert for research. So the message which you can send to researchers is that there are sort of many ways to do open science based on like, the available tools right now. It's not all about open access. This is where most of the conversation has focused over the last couple of decades. It, basically, I feel that whenever you commit to sharing your work so that others can use it or, or reuse it and just even learn from it, then that's a step towards a more open research culture, a healthier culture. And it's actually quite easy to be an open scientist. You, know, you don't have to be a tech guru. Um, you can just do things like upload your data to a repository. You know, it's, it's not difficult. There are small steps that everyone can take to be uh, more open in this case. And you know, for, for researchers, again, it doesn't really help. You know, um, researchers are not trained 
in scholarly communication and scholarly publishing by and large. They train to do research. But it does not hurt them to have more knowledge of the system in which they're working in. And this is a big problem at the moment because we're not really training researchers effectively when they come into university. So, you know, I, I always say like sharing is caring, and if you can make openness part of who you are as an individual, then that will give you essentially new knowledge and new skills that can be really useful to uh, accelerate your research, accelerate your growth um, and your career, and also teach you uh, hard and soft skills that you can also use outside of academia for when you almost inevitably don't get a permanent position. Right? <coughs> so, <coughs> the, the sort of carrot for this, or the incentive, is that even in spite of this crappy evaluation culture, whatever open science is, open research practices are inherently good for individuals. So, I'm gonna, what, what research out there shows is that essentially if you share your code, and if you share your data, and you make your research open access, or if you share what's called a preprint, you get more citations, you get them faster, you get to uh, still publish in the journals that you love, and make your work more rigorous and more reproducible, and you get more citations. Now, citations are like academic currency, right? There are these things that, you know, the more citations you have, the better you are as a scientist, right? It's, it's crap, but it's the way that, that things work. Um, there's a sort of shocking idea that the more people can reuse your work, the more they're likely to cite it. It makes perfect sense, right? So, you know, if you're locking your work away behind paywalls where no one can read it, no one really understands what you're doing, no one can actually analyze what you've done or build upon it, then you're not going to be as widely cited as the opposite of that, which is open science in this case. So openness is inherently good for individuals. Um, it's also bad for <coughs> every single other person out there. You know, the point is it's about uh, removing the limits and constraints of access to knowledge. So you, if you publish your work open access, for example, it means that policymakers can go and use it and use it to help inform policy. Great, this is what things that we want. It helps to level the playing field. Like if you go down to Africa, for example, they don't have the same privileged access that we do to journals. But if we make the work open access, it means that they can reuse that work, which is great. So it helps to promote equity in uh, access to uh, for research, particularly in developing countries. Um, yeah, um, if anyone wants some homework for tonight, there's a great paper out here, again by Aaron Kennan and colleagues, called How Open Science Helps Researchers Succeed. And this essentially reviews like the cultural change that we're going through right now. And a quote from this is, they say, um, the review of the literature demonstrating that open science, open research, is associated with increased citations, increased media attention, increased collaborators, and now in increasing job opportunities and funding. So the message that we should be saying is openness is better for everyone, you know, within the present system, no matter how much the research evaluation culture still sucks. Um, and yeah, crazy little nerdy gift to sort of say this. So like the message, again, open science is good science, being open is inherently good for you, it's good for your career, and it's good for the research. It helps to increase the dissemination of your work to vast numbers of people than those who just have access to the journals. It helps to emphasize your core values, that you believe that everyone should have the right, the right to access your research. So, um, and it makes you a more effective researcher. Like most of the researchers I know who've been doing this now for a fairly reasonable amount of time are becoming champions and leaders in their field. And it's really interesting to watch. They're like, you know, being invited all around the world to talk about their work and how open science has changed as part of it. Um, so yeah, positivity in this case. So like, again, like, the last part of this is going to be sort of like, what can we achieve if we all stand together, like as a sort of global community and make sure that what we're doing as researchers and support staff and librarians and all this sort of related research culture, what if we're making sure that what we're doing is acting in the best interests of people and not profit margins of publishers? <laughs> Shocking, right? Um, but cultural change is difficult. So what we need, this is my slide, this is the take home for all of you here. We need leadership, right? This means from the people who have the most power to make sure that they're investing in the future and not maintaining this dysfunctional system. Okay, and this means um, you know, asking students and asking other researchers and asking younger students. Now, you know, what is the system that you want to inherit and how can we create that for you so that you essentially are operating within a healthier research culture? The reason why this is so important okay, um, is because a lot of research out there is now showing just how toxic the research on academic culture is, particularly in Europe. Um, more than any other industry in the world, early career researchers, or demography, 
Elgar researchers are affected by mental health problems like anxiety, alcoholism, sleeping disorders, depression. 50% of, re of Elgar researchers suffer from a mental health disorder. That is more than two and a half times the next industry, which is the emergency services. <laughs> right, just think about the sort of culture that we want to create for the future of um, people. For, for individuals, it's to take small steps where we are. Like you don't have to do all of open science and smash capitalism and the patriarchy all in one day. Okay? You can do small open steps, one little bit at a time. Okay? It's a learning process. Um, but the problem is, like, again, if we're going to be taking small steps, we need to have the knowledge of where those steps uh, lead and, and, and how we can actually take them. And this is why, you know, again, we go into training, support, and communication being critical. I think sometimes we, um, we all have to be a little bit brave if we can, and this means standing up for what we believe in, and means identifying those who are creating the problems and you know, asking them to change in some cases. Ask the difficult questions again, like, you know, are you acting in the best interests of future generations of science and of society? Um, and just being sort of deeply introspective. Uh, I like this, just really thinking about why we are here as scientists, what we want to achieve. Um, if we're not uh, meeting those goals, what is the reason why not, and how can we close that divergence? You know, these simple little things that we can all do. So, my end little bit of uh, happiness is, like, what, what are some of the stuff I've been doing to sort of help address this? So, I built this thing for the Open Science MOOC. Uh, MOOC traditionally stands for Massively Open Online Course, but we call it Massively Open Online, Online Community. It's essentially a peer-to-peer -peer network of individuals, researchers, NGOs, companies, uh, policy makers, who all sort of work in terms of supporting and training and teaching each other about all of the things which I've just mentioned, you know, but you know, based around the idea that you know our access to, to science is a fundamental human right, and you know we sort of embed uh, these sort of values within what we do. Um, if you like, the whole idea of this is it's a community. It's just people teaching each other. We build, we're building tools and resources um, and uh, trainers to essentially help address these major problems that we face. You know, we have things like a, an open Slack channel for discussion with more than a thousand people on it. We have uh, thousands of people enrolled on the actual courses themselves, so learning these little practices that I mentioned. Um, everything we develop is completely in the open, um, and you don't even, so like, for example, you know, if you want to learn about open access in Latin America, there's a video for that. And everything we build is openly licensed for people to reuse and adapt for how they want. Um, we have a steering committee and an advisory board who's job is primarily to uh, make sure that what I'm saying is accurate, essentially. <laughs> um, and yeah, like we're just uh, massively openly collaborative. And the whole idea is um, that if we are providing massive scale education, training, and support, then what we can start doing is empowering uh, leaders to be, uh, empowering individuals to become the, next, the leaders of the next generation. Um, and then if we start doing that, then we can start to address these problems of uh, bias and abuse from the status quo, essentially, in this case, and building a community where we can start to um, collaborate more effectively on the problems that we face, including changing this incentive structure. Um, I'll skip the last few slides, actually. It's, it's a really great thing to, uh, to be part of. Like, we invite essentially anyone to join us. We're actually we're very explicit. If you work for Elsevier and Springer, we don't really want you to be part of this community, but essentially everyone else is invited. Um, this is a volunteer initiative that we launched about nine months ago, ten months ago, and you know we're uh, completely organic in how we grow. Um, you know, it's just a, it's, a, it's just a community space. We have like over 150 people spending their time creating these resources in the open through GitHub. We have more than a thousand people on our discussion channel, essentially all interacting with each other on a daily basis. Like even right now, people are uh, chatting with each other about how to learn and uh, develop in this sort of space. Um, we're integrating the European Open Science Cloud quite comfortably at the moment, um, which is quite nice. So we're becoming like, integrated with the sort of high-level changes happening here. And we're developing modules on things like citizen science and public engagement with science um, and open access, of course. So yes, I invite you to join us. This is sort of the representation of our community. Denmark is somewhere in the big blob. People that have already joined us there, you know, we're, we're growing uh, at an alarmingly rapid pace. And like the whole idea is like, right, how do we get to where we want? This means we actually have to have a goal within all of this. But like, imagine if we just had a future where the values of, the, of uh, things like 
uh, of good individuals, you know, that we believe in things like equal access to knowledge and the principles of good or open science that science should be inherently rigorous and reproducible. Imagine if that was the future, where all knowledge which we create as a society with, with limitations is, uh, is available as a public good and not to be used and treated like a commodity to be traded away by private companies. And at the end, you know, isn't this just good science, right? So in five years' time, also, I want to stop using the term open science. I mean, you start following it, rigorous science and crap, essentially. Like things that does not adhere to basic scientific standards. But like the ultimate goal it is similar to what I mentioned with this global open access alliance. What we need to do is make sure that we're all working together to pool all of our knowledge and all of our resources, which we have, which are currently within the system, to make sure that we're creating a decentralized scholarly infrastructure with communities as the focus, and it has to be non-profit and led by communities. And if we're not really reaching for that goal, then we're probably not acting in the best interests of science or society and talking about creating a healthier culture. And like I said, it's going to be based on these kind of strong values and strong principles, where the goal essentially is science is a public good, where it works for the betterment of society. If we're not going towards that, then we're doing something very, very wrong. And this is, you know, again, goes back to what I said about planets and transformative agreements, might not necessarily be doing this in some cases. And uh, I'll leave with an inspirational quote. So you might recognize a couple of the people here. These are my advisors and my steering committee, who I'm always deeply, deeply thankful for, for the support which they bring. And uh, with a quote from American philosopher Margaret Mead, she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, except we're not a small group, we're a huge group. And <laughs> yeah, this is, this is the end. Uh, these are the people who are changing the world. And I invite you to come and be part of it for us. So, Ta-da. <laughs>
is important to the individual, but I guess university rankings, looking at it from an institutional perspective, is also one of the drivers of the wrong direction, so to say, because I thought, at least if I put forward to my board, say we want to go all open, uh, ignore nature and science publishing for a decade, just until we fix the system, uh, we'll drop 100 places on the university rankings, what do you think about them? <laughs> <laughs> and, but, uh, and, and of course, that's, I guess, also the, the, the devilish thing about this, that, as you say, we're all in a system yeah. where it's incredibly difficult to get out because the first to go out has to pay a very high price, whereas mm -hmm. those who are followers, late followers, may benefit from waiting and not mm -hmm. actually take the pain. So, so you say a, a movement of individuals at the end of the day, mm -hmm. small, dedicated, committed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is what can change this terrible thing, or what you see being the most important levels in actually making the change? That was an excellent question. Um, I mean, the, the institutional rankings, like, I mean, why, why do we even subscribe to them? You know, Times Higher Education and these rankings, they're meaningless. If you look, yeah, at, the completely. If you look at the statistics behind them, most of, them are, most of the data is provided by Elsevier for starters. <laughs> like, um, and it's this all is incredibly is corrupt. <laughs> like, th these institutional rankings are one of the most dangerous things, I think, out there. Like, if you look at them, they're essentially just reinforcing the macro effect. You know, it's the oldest, most wealthy research institutes that dominate the top of the rankings. Sure. Um, and they just continue to generate more systemic problems from that. I, I honestly don't know what, the, what you can do. Like, it's this sort of lock-in, right? That we all have, like, no one wants to put themselves at risk at a number of levels. Because you obviously benefit from being very tiny. Did they be, yeah, I mean, like, well, 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 university, well, your tuition fees yeah, yeah, can sure. double those of lower yeah. ranking universities. If you are a European university, you would probably be, let's say, less scrutinized when you apply for funding mm -hmm. if you are higher ranked. Mm -hmm. So if Sorbonne or this university applies to the Brussels mm -hmm. framework programs, maybe we are more likely to get it than an unknown lower ranking mm -hmm. university. Uh, and those are the mechanisms that I believe give us this uh, gridlock situation that we somehow need to find our way out of. Mm. I mean, like, uh, maybe a different way of looking at it is maybe not to get out of the rankings, but how can you actually encourage those who are providing the rankings to be more fair in how they operate? And what I, what I learned last week is that there, there are some like five or six different ranking organizations, right? Okay. So Lizzie Gad, who visited uh, here a couple of weeks ago, I think is now leading an organization that is now evaluating the evaluators and seeing like, how they actually operate and how all of a sudden they'll be preyed upon. So they, what we're hoping in the future is that you don't necessarily have to get rid of the rankings, but if you can actually make them sort of like open up their data and their methods and their processes and then allow universities to compete fairly within that system, mm -hmm. that's probably better than doing more of it all together, right? And that's something we're going to just, you know, last week was like part of the press. So. But yeah, I was also strongly recommend getting Lizzie to come and give a talk to you about that. <laughs> She's fantastic. You can have coffee now, can I? If there are no, if there is no more questions, uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, rings and the possibility of the networking and discussing more things uh, between us and, uh, and uh, talking to, to John. Mm -hmm. I'll stay around. <laughs> right, thank you all so much.